this was not done done by a single person, right? So now the time is over for a single person to make a change. Those are past, right? Now, now you need big groups to make a change. Okay. So quantum field field theory tried to resolve the tension between special relativity and quantum mechanics. So these these were indeed the three 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 big things, a uh, two big things that came before this year, right? You had special relativity and quantum mechanics, but but you realize that they they, they, they don't fit together. When you want to fit fit together, you realize that you need something which we call quantum field field theory or QFT. So what is the problem when we try 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 to fit fit this two, two things? Okay, we have an eraser. So we we all know that quantum mechanics is a non-relativistic theory. Does everybody know this? Okay. The way we see see is is the following. We have our favorite Schrodinger equation, which reads this like this: H psi is I H capital. And H is an operator that we write, write in this way, right? Okay. Now look, this this p squared by 2m is a non-relativistic formula for kinetic energy. And you cannot use it when things move faster and faster and faster. So like in a in a high Hydrogen atom, the reason why <coughs> quantum mechanics works so well is that the speed of electron is not very large compared to the, the speed of light. That's like 1 over 137 for hydrogen atom. So, so, so it works as a good approximation. But what if we try, try to push this boundary? We say that let's have an electron that is going faster and faster and very close to the speed of light, then for sure this will not work. Because we are using a formula that holds in the non-relativistic regime, right? So what, what should we do? So we should have something that we might call relativistic quantum mechanics, right? Relativistic quantum mechanics, where you you replace this p squared by 2m, but by the <coughs> appropriate formula that is relevant in the relativistic regime. You replace this p squared by 2m by something else then and you call that relativistic quantum mechanics. But then you realize that this program is doomed. Okay? Doesn't work. So if 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 you hear the word relativistic quantum mechanics you you would understand that there is nothing like this. All we have is relativistic quantum field theory. So I'm, I'm going to tell you what that means. But I want to tell you why first, why this is doomed, why, why it doesn't work. Because relativistic quantum me me mechanics leads to paradoxes. Paradoxes, for example, violation of causality. But that's bad because you you don't want to violate cause causality. Namely, we always assume in physics that the cause precedes the effect. 
So, but you you can violate causal if you are doing uh, uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. For example, suppose you have a state x at time t, okay, and then you have another state x plus del x is these these are position eigenkets, right? At time t plus del t, for example, right? And now, now you want to find the amplitude of transition. So, say in in time del t, you have u of del t, which is the uh, transition amplitude between these two two states, and you realize when you make the ex explicit computation, you see the following. That you have, uh, let me write down for you the exact formula. Okay, here they are. So you find this. This is this. For, for a massive part, part, particle of mass m, you see that the amplitude goes like this. for non-relativistic case and for the re relativistic case you get something slightly more, more complicated Outside the light form, namely for so u del t is not zero for space like separation. Does everybody know what space like separation means? Yes. So two two points that are not causally connected, right? So you you have the light form, say x is in this direction, time is in that direction, these things are light forms, right? Right? These angles are 45 degrees. Oh, okay. I I have to tell you something. So just a di digression here. I for, forward to tell you. Okay. So we work we will work throughout this school in natural units okay? which means that you choose the speed of light c to be 1 and the constant h bar to be 1 what, what does it mean we all know that the the speed of light is like 3, point, 3 times 10, 10 to the 8 meters per second so let's choose a unit of length or like x which is uh, 1x is uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters <coughs> So then the speed of light in these units should be 1x per second. So in these units, the numerical value is 1. So you can always choose a unit in which the numerical value of c is 1 and the numerical value of h cut is 1. So these units are called natural units. It, it does not mean, mean the constant is 1. Right, so why why we are setting them to one? Because we are not working, as I said, we are not working working <coughs> in the non-relativistic regime, nor we are working in the new, Newtonian world. So H 
that is not zero and C is not infinite. By the way, when we say H cut is tends to zero, what does it mean? It's a it's a constant, right? So what does it mean? Mean that the constant goes to zero? Does it make sense? We have thank you. We have thank you. So that the constant cannot cannot go to zero. It, its value depends on on your units. In particular, in these units, the value of H cut is one. So what does it mean when we say H cut goes to zero? It means that you deal with physical systems where characteristic one quantities that have the same dimension of H bar, those quantities are much larger than H bar. Like action, when you heat, heat, heat a ball and make a six in cricket, did you compute the action? The action in, in unit of H bar is like 10, 10, 10, 10 to the 24, something like that. So it's huge. So compared to that, um, the value of H bar is very, very small. Okay. So like this, when you move very slowly, your speed is very small compared to C. So in this respect, the speed of light is infinite. So things, things in physics are always relative, but it doesn't make sense to say, say that the constant goes somewhere. You, you know what it means. So we use these units, and in these units, the light, light cone will have a 45 degree here. And so when, when we say, say that the two, two points have space-like separation, we mean that the distance between them in mean, mean Mean Bounsky space is this, right? Uh, so del ts squared is what? Del t squared minus del x squared, right? So, and this, when this thing is less than less than zero, we call it space like separation, right? <coughs> So, so you you cannot send a light light signal, right? So the the point is that this this one quantities are non non zero for space like separation. And then wow, well, what does it mean? When you have two points that, that are space-like separated, you can always use a Lorentz transformation. Namely, you go to a different Lorentz frame to change the time order. There is no, no dis distinction per se between past, past and future. Okay. So if there is a non-zero transition between these two states that are space-like separated, then you violate causality. The reason why this is not a problem in New Newtonian quantum mechanics is that C, C goes to infinity. So per se, there is no speed limit. And you you don't see this flipping of time time order past never becomes future and vice versa. But in non in in relativistic case, the past can become future by a Lorentz transformation. You just move, and then things all all hell breaks loose, right? So this is one of the problems, and there are many more problems which made us realize that. We should be doing quantum field field theory. I I did not tell you yet what that means, but I just try try to tell you why why we had quantum field theory because there is tension when you want to make a relativistic generalization of quantum mechanics. There is a tension, and you want to solve this problem, and you realize the only thing you have to do is Relativistic quantum field theory. Okay. So, so quantum field.
little field theory as I already told you is is the is the language when you want to do relativistic physics at the same time you want to do quantum physics you are doing both and so we 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 can actually draw a nice nice diagram that will help you remember all this so we here we have newtonian physics so suppose we want to make h bar finite okay. which which is what which is what you you know already right so we we want to have actions say in a system that are small <laughs> so h bar finite gives you gives you quantum mechanics right so you need to have have a new fra framework now what if here you do c c finite then you give rise to special relativity Yeah, this, this, and this. And then came the question, now what? You want to make h bar finite with special relativity or you want to make c finite with quantum mechanics. What happens? So there you go, you have QF key. So this QF key is, is a framework that tells you how to deal with relativistic <coughs> quantum systems. Okay, so I I give you some examples that use this framework or language, and these these theories have been extremely successful. So much so that we now take quantum field theory as a religion, right? It's like a religion now. So examples of quantum field theory. First example was quantum electrodynamics. Dynamics or QED. <coughs> For example, when you do in, in undergrad, when you do classical electrodynamics, right, you have H bar equal to <coughs> what? Zero. Okay. Do you have C finite or C, uh, C infinity in classical uh, electrodynamics? Classical electrodynamics is already a relativistic theory. Yeah. Okay, C is finite. Okay. Yeah. That is precisely why there, there was a tension be, between Newtonian physics and classical electrodynamics that we had to solve. Because this theory by, by default is relativistic. Now you want to have a quantum version of it. That gives rise to quantum electrodynamics. For example, any electron is interacting with photon and then you want to see what happens you need this theory okay. then we can give you the example of quantum well electroweak theory okay. that deals with weak nuclear force and you realize that when you want to explain which nuclear force in the framework of quantum field theory there is no way to leave electrodynamics aside it must be a part part of it so there is no way to describe weak force without electrodynamics there is no way electrodynamics itself is a good theory but there is no good theory of weak force itself so in this sense it's a unification. Okay, it unifies electromagnetic force and weak nuclear force. 
Then came quantum chromodynamics. Chromodynamics. QCD, yes? This is quantum field theory, right? We are not, not, there is no classical version of weak force. Unfortunately, the only class, classical forces we have is electromagnetism and gravity. The rest, the weak and strong nuclear forces are quantum by nature because you don't see, see, see them in macroscopic world, <laughs> right? So quantum chromodynamics is the quantum field theory of strong nuclear force. So you have two, two different theories for weak electromagnetism one and <clears throat> strong nuclear force. And then you might want to combine them in what we call grand unified theories. Okay, grand unified theories, they merge this piece to two head shape. <laughs> that, you call them that. We, we don't know if that's their correct description of nature, but they are extremely appealing because they unify all the non-gravitational forces that we have in, have in nature. But you will be surprised to know that quantum field theory actually is, is more universal than you think. Even string theory is a quantum field, field theory. Okay? So are, are you surprised by this? String theory is a quantum field theory in one, one plus one dimension. So you do a quantum field theory of a, a relativistic string whose word sheet is a two-dimensional two object length and time and then, then you realize that this, this can give birth to everything else. But this is basically a quantum field theory in one plus one dimension. So, so you realize that you need quantum field theory even to understand string theory. So then there is a more fancier thing within string theory which is called string field theory and one of our speakers is is a founding founding father of it, Ashok Sen and he created this field. Actually string field theory is is the theory we should be doing, but it's so so complicated that very few few in the world is working on it. But that's that makes more sense. In some sense, string theory is like quantum mechanics, and and string field theory is like uh, quantum field field theory. You, you might think of it. So doing quantum mechanics is approximation. What you should be doing is this, but it is so so complicated that. You need people like Sen to be working on them. Okay, so all these are examples of uh, quantum field field theories. But then in in the list, list that I gave you, that trying trying to resolve the problems of existing theories in physics, I I did not give you. A thing that's ongoing challenge. All I gave you are examples that that have been done, worked out. But there is another example where there is a tension. Namely, in this world, we have two good descriptions of nature, namely quantum field theory, all this, and gravity. gravity. General relativity is another, and there is a there is a tension between them. Namely, you, you see funny things happening when you consider black holes. Information might be lost and that's not good. So it means that we don't have a correct, correct theory. Just like you see causality is, is violated in uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, but it's not in 
quantum field theory. The way, the, so I might go to that. So let me make a, make a side, side remark. The way quantum field theory says causality is that you have transition amplitude for particles and anti anti-particles. In quantum field theory, you always have an anti-particle for every part particle and then the transition amplitudes they have a destructive interference so the transition probability becomes zero okay so what was the last thing i was say, saying quantum gravity so you there is a there is a tension like black black, black hole inversion paradox you call it uh, loss of uni unitarity and you want to solve this problem and you Think of a theory that you don't, don't have yet, you call it quantum gravity. But if you talk with people like Sen, he will tell you that we, we have already solved, we have already found a theory of quantum gra gra gravity, which is string theory. For sure, string theory is a potential candidate of quantum gravity, but we don't know yet if nature realizes string theory you have to be fair okay we don't know yet if nature realizes <coughs> string theory all we know is that it's an extremely beautiful theory extremely nice but beautiful things they don't have to be correct well you 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 might believe that it is correct but it might not not all beautiful Beautiful things are good, right? So, um, okay, so quantum gra gravity is what is the goal of physics these, these days. You want to have a theory that does not have a conflict between quantum framework and general relativity. So, you will have a different set of lectures on GR and throughout the main school, you will. You, you will learn more. Okay. Okay. So, what is next? Next, we talk about. Okay. So, 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 so far, I did not tell you what we mean by field, field theory, right? I gave you some reason why we need field theory. I gave you some examples. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you what a field theory is. So just like. Just like mechanics, where you have classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, right? You also have classical field theory and quantum field theory. So that's one example of relativistic classical field theory. You here, classical means what? Not, not quantum, okay? Examples are classical electrodynamics and general relativity. General relativity is a classical theory. When you want to find its quantum version, you need quantum gravity, which we don't know what it is. So, and then, of course, you have tons of examples of non-relativistic classical field theory. A lot. Can you can some somebody give me one example of a non non-relativistic classical field theory? Well, you you don't have to go go that far. When I am talking to you okay the sound wave is going to you and there is displacement of air air molecules and this qualifies as a non relativistic classical field simplest example is that that you all know this disturbance of a stretched string Thing, right or by vibration of a vibration 
of a drum, right? So when a drum drum vibrates, you have the flat surface and the surface is fluctuating. This is a field, non-relatively non, non stick field, or the transverse vibration of strings in guitar. So in this case, we will give a concrete example of longitudinal longitudinal vibration of a rod. Okay. Say you you have a rod which is a one dimensional object and you hit it on one side and you, you know sound wave will pass through. Now this rod you can <coughs> approximate as a continuum, right? You you might forget about the molecular structures and think think of it as a Continuum. So you have some some fluctuations going on in a continuum. Whenever you have some fluctuations going on in a continuum, you might be doing field theory. That might be relativistic or non non relativistic. These are non non relativistic. But when you think of fluctuations of electromagnetic field in space time, you are doing relativistic classical field theory, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, I will do this example to show you what we mean by field theory. That, that's the simplest case. That's a non-relativistic classical field theory, but we, we might be talking about relativistic quantum field theory. But just to show you, since, since it, it, it might be something new to you, I would like to work out this particular example. Okay. So suppose we have a rod and we can approximate the rod as in infinitely many mass spring systems. The molecules they, they are bonding, so so the bondings we can approximate with a string, and then the molecules we can approximate with a point mass, and then another spring, another point mass, another spring, so on, so on, so forth. Let's say that the distance between two masses is A, okay? And then let's say that each mass is M, and each spring has a spring constant K. In reality, there is no spring, but we, we can approximate the molecular in interaction as a as a spin. Okay. Now what happens when we have a transverse vibration of this is that this these masses will move, right? These masses will move and in in the spring you have you have stretching and And compression, right? So it might happen that this mass, this guy is stretched. So this mass comes here, and this is very long now. Okay, very long. Now this mass is here, say, and this spring is compressed, say. Okay. So there, there can be a mode like this where one spring is, is stretched and the remaining, right? You have done this problem in, uh, in classical mechanics. So you, you might have a mode like that. So suppose this mass is <coughs> this mass is well, this is. There is a mass. So this mass is I call the ith mass, and this mass well. So call this mass i plus one. This is mass i, and this this mass we call i minus one. So 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 we can count each molecule with this i. So now this i i plus one goes here, and this i goes here. So there is a net displacement of this guy, right? 
from here to here we call it eta i plus 1 and there is also a net dis displacement of this guy we call it eta i okay? so there is displacement and because of this the Lagrangian corresponding to the ith system so with each each system you might be considering a spring and one mass so for the ith system the Lagrangian is this m eta i dot squared minus half k eta i plus one minus eta i okay. so that's for the i system when you have to con consider the whole whole system you need to take a sum of them right yes thank you i so you just have this half m eta i dot squared minus half k eta i plus one minus eta i whole squared right it's just Sum. And that's what you call Lagrangian. Now I want to take a continuum limit. I said that I don't want to see the mole mole molecular structure. I want to make it a continuum. Namely, I want to take, take the limit where a goes to zero. So a, a, again, what does it mean a goes to zero? That's a that's a distance which is this, right? Sorry? It becomes continuous. Oh, no, you see, see, see the system from large scale. You don't use a microscope. <laughs> that scale is very, very small compared to what you can measure. You are not using a microscope. That's all it means, right? So you have to understand what this means. So you are looking at the problem from a macroscopic point of view, not from a microscopic point of view. So where do we take, take this limit? We can say that m by a is my mu, right? It's mu is, is my mass per unit length. Right? And I have one more thing which is called young young modulus. My young young modulus this young young modulus y is this k eta i plus one minus eta i by eta i plus one minus eta i by k that we call k a you agree so this is Stress by strain, strain, right? That you call Young models, and when you simplify this, that's just K, K A. Okay. So now we write this guy, this Lagrangian, we write in this way: sum, sum, sum over I A half <coughs> half M by A theta I dot square minus half k a eta i plus 1 minus eta i by a okay. so you can write it like this and then then you want to take take the limit when a goes to 0 and in this limit, you you get what? Is this clear to you how we get this? We I I I wrote for you the same thing. Yes. Okay. This this is the same as this. So now we take take the continuum limit, and you realize that in this limit, this this becomes this. First of all, in the continuum limit, the sum will become an integration. 
and then you you realize that when you consider this eta i you are considering the ith molecule right and that ith mo molecule is fixed somewhere when you are in the equilibrium right so you you don't consider mo molecule number i plus 100 when you write this that's well defined so you are measuring this at a particular point in space that's why you need a partial derivative with respect to time namely you keep space fixed and here you keep time fixed right because you are not measuring this at, at different times right there here you have a snapshot and this snapshot is taken at a particular time when you write this time is fixed that's why you have that okay so now you have a field field theory right because this guy is a field so what is a field so say say this rod 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 has a length say zero to l so you might write like that right if you have this length so This is the Lagrangian for, for the rod. But what, what does it mean? So you have something, eta, which is a classical non-relativistic field, okay? Eta, which is a fun function of x and t, right? I'm calling it a function, but that's not a correct word for it. I, I will tell you. Why? <clears throat> it's a fun function of x and t. But what is this guy? This guy is simply the displacement from equilibrium of a particular molecule, right? But then you label them as i. Eta i, eta i plus 1. But now you have a continuum limit, so the label becomes continuous. You no, no longer have a discrete label. So you might think of this as oscillation at each point point in space this is a continuous label right this i becomes x and this is a fun fun function of time there is one way of saying this okay so now whenever you have a lagrangian from from the lagrangian you can find the Euler Lagrange equations. Do you know what the Euler Lagrange equation will be like? So there are two two ways of doing it. First, you it's extremely easy for you to find the Euler Lagrange equation from here and find it, and then you take take the continuum limit. There is one way, or you can simply take the Euler Lagrange equation for this field field theoretical Lagrange. So by the way, in <coughs> Field theory, since we are doing continuum, it makes more sense to talk about Lagrangian density, not Lagrangian. So this this thing will be my Lagrangian den density curly L. And Lagrangian is simply the volume integration of Lagrangian density. But in field theory, we always talk about Lagrangian density, but still we call it Lagrangian because it takes more time to say Lagrangian density and we are lazy people. So in field theory, Lagrangian means Lagrangian density. So you can write, write an action in this way, right? Action is time integral of Lagrangian. And that in this case is space time integral of Lagrangian density. Okay. So yes, now coming Coming to the point, for this Lagrangian density or for this La Lagrangian, you can find the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion. And what what do they look like? I'm not going going deep deep into this, but you all can find this that this will look like this. <clears throat> Mu d eta dt whole square is y d eta dx whole square. Sorry. 
<coughs> okay, so what is this? What is this? This is a wave, and what kind of wave is this? What kind of wave can you have in a rod with a longitudinal vibration? What kind of wave is this? Sound. It's a sound wave, right? So you realize there is a sound wave, and that's a very nice way of saying there should be a sound wave. You you don't need to observe it. You just do this, and you realize there is a sound wave. And Lo and behold, the speed is exactly what we know, right? It's y by mu because this wave has this particular speed. That's the sound speed in a solid, for example, right? So, okay, now now you have an example of a non-relativistic classical field. I I will tell you now what what you mean by a field. So, is a distribution over space time. So, what is a distribution? Earlier I said that it's a function of space time like eta. Mm. Distributions are more, more general than functions. Every function is a distribution, but every distribution might not be a function. But you can always write a distribution in a Fourier D decomposition. Okay? So like the uh, delta function, direct delta function is not really a function, it's a distribution because you, you cannot really write down a simple formula that maps the real line to a direct delta, right? It's not a function, you, we, we call it a distribution and the tendency signature of a distribution is that you will always will have a Fourier transformation of this, of a function, you take a function you take a Fourier transformation, you will end up with a distribution. Like direct del delta is a Fourier transformation of Unit. one. One is a function, <coughs> is a good, good function, and okay. So <coughs> a field will always have a Fourier transformation. That's the thing, and so it's a distribution over space time, like. Eta was a distribution over space time. Namely, you say that I choose this instant of time, I choose this point on the rod, I want to see that particular molecule, how far it, it went from the equilibrium. And yeah, that's my field. Okay, so now, <coughs> one more thing, I told you about Naturally, units, but you might some of you might wonder what does it mean high energy physics? <coughs> Are we doing quantum mechanics? Why why am I talking about quantum physics? And the name of the school is high energy physics, right? So you some of you might wonder about it. So we have the famous uncertainty principle <coughs> that says that uncertainty in p, uncertainty in a, x. Simultaneously, they are well larger than equal to half h r, right? Okay, and in in quantum world, this is always like this. You can say it is order h r. So now, if h cut is one, so these things are order one. So you realize that momentum is the inverse of length, right? Mass. And, and since C, C is one, mass and energy and momentum, they all, all have the same units. And since H cut, cut is one, length has the inverse unit of mass, so on and so forth. So high energy means what? High energy means short distance, right? 
or not? High energy means high momentum, high, high momentum means short distance. So uh, high energy physics means short distance physics. And in short distance, you can do quantum mechanics and you can also do quantum <coughs> So quantum me me mechanics is not high energy physics because that is 100 years old. That was high energy physics 100 years ago, not now. Okay, and, and the definition of high energy physics is changing. The definition of high energy physics 60 years ago was nuclear physics, and now we consider nuclear physics as a very low energy physics because we we understand it clearly. So we are pushing the limit high, 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 and that's where we are finding new 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 physics, like we are finding the heat, right. Higgs is found at a scale which is much larger than the nu nuclear scale. <coughs> what is a nu nuclear scale? It's a few hundred MeV. And the mass of Higgs is a few hundred GeV, which is three orders of magnitude. Okay. So, and we might be doing ultra high energy physics, which is yeah. string theory, quantum gravity. They play a role in Planck. But that's not the part part of my my lecture now. I think it should be clear to you what it means uh, high energy physics, and then okay comes this uh, classical field field theory. Now, okay. So now 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 we can talk about <laughs> relativistic classical field field theory. Okay. What's the time? So when you you do re relativity, you should be talking about Lorentz symmetry, right? Lorentz transformation and symmetry. So you say, say that a relativistic theory is Lorentz invariant, right? So when you write down a Lagrangian or you write down an action, you make a Lorentz transformation, that action doesn't change, and okay, then you say that your theory is Lorentz invariant. When you have a symmetry, the symmetry of re relativity is Lorentz transformation plus space-time, Translation. Okay. So you you rotate your frame, you boost your frame, you shift the coordinate of your space, you shift the coordinate of your time. Physics should not change. In particular, if you see, if you want to measure some probability amplitude, that should not change on all these things. That's what you mean when you say your there is invariant under this. You want to measure some transition amplitude, it should not change with where you are. It's the same phenomenon and should have the same physical measurements, irrespective of all these things. So combined, this thing is called Poincaré symmetry or Poincaré transformation. So and any of theory should have Poincaré symmetry. So when we do Relativistic field theory it might be classical. We always have Poincaré symmetry, and when we quantize it, when we change, we make h bar to be finite, we have more more complication. But for now, let's consider only classical theory. Okay, so classical field theory might have this symmetry. It might have more more symmetry, but there are a few. Uh, so let's uh, write down one action. Say, say we are in four four dimension. We'll have this volume volume measure, and you have the Lagrangian density, right? And that that Lagrangian might consist of a field, and the first derivative of the field, say, okay. And then, then you have Euler-Lagrange 
two extremes of <coughs> and that leads this. So this Lagrangian density is a functional of the field and and the derivatives of the field. <coughs> And then you can take this functional and <coughs> you can take partial derivative with respect to the field or the derivatives of the field and this will be your euler lagrange equation of motion. I, I, I did not tell you yet what this <coughs> d, d mu means but I'm going to tell you soon. So just wait. <coughs> so that's one thing that you should know in the context of classical field, field theory. And one more thing that you might want to know is Noether's theorem. Noether's theorem is a very powerful theorem that says <coughs> that if you have a theory and so your action has a continuous global symmetry, then you have Conserved currents. Conserved currents and that might give you conserved charges. Conserved charges. Okay, so what does it mean to have a continuous global symmetry? Continuous symmetry means you make a you make a transformation, you make some change and your theory does not change, your Lagrangian does not change. That's so what do you mean when you that that's a that's a transformation but when you say you have a continuous transformation namely you can make this change infinitesimally small so that that infinitesimal of <coughs> version of the change exists it doesn't have to be a finite change it can be infinitesimally small when that that happens you call this a continuous transformation and when this continuous transformation is a symmetry it's a continuous symmetry and Global means this symmetry. Transformation doesn't change at different points in space time. So this transformation parameter is not a function of space time. It, it, it doesn't change. Like all these examples that I wrote down in a classical relativistic field theory, these things are continuous global symmetry. And for all of these you have conserved currents and you also have conserved charges. So Lorentz transformation has special ro ro rotation in it and wha what is the conserved charge corresponding to it? Do you know? Angular momentum. Angular momentum. That's right. Angular momentum is conserved thanks to Noether's theorem that you have rotation in space and that doesn't change your action. But you, you also have the boost, right? Boost means you have a frame and you go boost it and you have a frame that is moving, right? With a constant velocity. <coughs> boost does, anybody know what is the conserved charge corresponding to boost? Do you know? What's your name? Okay, do you know again? Should there be conserved charge or not? Corresponding to boost, boost is a con continuous global transformation, right? So what is it? Oh, you 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 never thought about it, right? It's the position of <coughs> center of mass. You you have a body and you make a Lorentz boost. Things will change. The body will shrink, right? When you make a Lorentz boost. Uh, I will look slimmer, right? Like this. So, but my center of mass will not change. Okay. So, and then finally, you have time time translation, time translation, which has a positive charge, which is what energy, and you have space translation, which has positive charge, which is three. Momentum. Okay, so these are examples of Noether charges. So you will have many more 
Examples, I think it's a good time for me to take a break now. Oh, 35. Okay, let's let's have a break of 25 minutes. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you.